Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. If you're a Twimble listener, you probably have an opinion about AI. Are you looking forward to the role AI plays in your life? Are you fearful of the changes AI will bring? Or maybe you're just skeptical and don't think AI will make a real difference in the near future. Whatever the case, we want to hear your take. So hit pause right now and jump on over to twimmelai.com slash myai to let us know what you think. Sharing your thoughts takes two minutes and qualifies you to win some great prizes. Before we proceed, I want to give a quick shout out to everyone who has submitted a video so far. So here's to you, Krishnan, Amara, Keith, Sriram, Shirin, Rob, Julian, and Chandana. In today's episode, I'm joined by Roland Mimishevich, co-founder, CEO, and chief scientist at 20 Billion Neurons. Roland joined me at the Rework Deep Learning Summit in Montreal to discuss the work his company is doing to train deep neural networks to understand physical actions. In our conversation, we dig into video analysis and understanding, including how data-rich video can help us develop what Roland calls comparative understanding, or AI common sense. We touch on the implications of AI systems having comparative understanding and how Roland and his team are addressing problems like getting properly labeled training data. All right, let's go. All right, everyone, I am here at the Rework Deep Learning Conference in Montreal, and I am with Roland Mimi Shevich. Uh, Roland is a founder and chief scientist at 20 Billion Neurons a company that's based in Toronto and Berlin and is doing some pretty interesting things. Roland, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Well, thanks very much for having me. Uh, It's great to meet you. Um, Why don't we get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in uh, the field? I was interested, I have been interested in AI uh, throughout my career over the last, I would say, almost 20 years. Um, I was a student in Germany. I'm based from Germany. Uh, and did neural network research there as a master student. Um, and then since the space was uh, fairly sparse uh, in terms of supervision and so on at that time, I uh, decided to go to Toronto to um, work with Jeff Hinton as an advisor to do a PhD in 2003. Um, Not a bad choice. That's true, <laughs> yes. And it has been a fantastic time. And uh, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, I learned a lot and, and, and enjoyed my time very much in Toronto. I also like the city, incidentally, very much, and I'm mm-hmm. back now in Toronto, partly for that reason. And uh, so I did. I spent a few years there doing research on neural networks uh, with a very strong interest in video understanding specifically. Um, and like in all the sub-areas in deep learning and AI uh, In video understanding, we also experienced uh, some nice advances and, you know, cute, interesting results here and there, but not the amazing breakthrough that we all felt had to be imminent somehow, but just never really happened. Mm -hmm. And so then I uh, moved around a little bit. Uh, I was an assistant professor in Germany for some time and then at the University of Montreal for the last couple of years. Okay. Um, And then... uh, ImageNet happened along the way in 2012, mm-hmm. and we realized that the same thing has to happen for video uh, mm. because there was just no fundamental reason why it wouldn't. And so um, we started, myself and uh, some from our, our friends and colleagues from Germany, started to uh, kind of think a little bit about the possibility of just launching a company that would combine uh, research perspective and, and leadership from my side primarily and uh, the ability to build a company uh, with a strong culture and so on um, from their side. So all of these have been colleagues who had been in machine learning for many years but had successfully built companies and so on. And uh, and we felt like it was the right moment to come together, uh, address 
the problems uh, uh, head on by you know building the right kind of engineering environment and operation that would solve data problems specifically and, and big engineering problems and uh, and see how far we can get and uh, so we got together uh, about a year and a half ago um, and uh, established a lab in Toronto where there's still a lot of talent uh, in Canada specifically as well as a lab in Berlin where my, my friends from there are based. Mm -hmm. um, the company is called 20 Billion Neurons and um, we have completely focused on video analysis and video understanding and uh, have made quite some progress there that I'd be happy to chat about more in, in a few moments. Awesome. So as part of this I stepped away from my role as an assistant professor at University of Montreal uh, to dedicate my work full time to this effort, um, because I feel like we are really, really onto something, mm. and uh, and it takes basically all of your energy to, to really <laughs> push that through. Obviously, right, right. right. Uh, so you started out with uh, this kind of idea for a grand challenge, uh, accumulating a video data set analogous to ImageNet. Right. ImageNet is a huge undertaking, you know, just for images. I can hardly imagine um, something of the same scale and impact uh, on the video side. What must be involved in doing that? Like, where are we? Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. And it's actually the analogy is not perfect because videos are a different beast than images mm -hmm. um, uh, on various levels. Obviously, uh, the data amount is just ridiculously large by comparison right. to images because there's time and you have like a factor 100, just like there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to increase the amount of pixels that you have to look at, basically. Uh, but then also uh, what video is really representing and what it's what it's about. Um, videos are not about showing an object, you know, and, and the task uh, usually associated with video is not figuring out that there is an orange in the field of view or a, a dog or a human or something, mm -hmm. but it's much more about verbs, subtle interactions, uh, the ways people behave in it, uh, relationships between objects over time, how they change. Um, and so on and so forth. So video is really quite a different thing in its own, on its own. Mm -hmm. um, that is, though, at the same time a challenge, uh, uh, but also uh, an, uh, an amazing opportunity. Um, the, one of the reasons, I, I would say that actually the reason why I've been drawn to video uh, throughout my career has been that um, video can teach you a lot more than images can, and than text can, incidentally. If you have a system that's able to understand some subtle aspects of video and can make some subtle distinctions, mm -hmm. like for example, understand the difference between putting an object on top of another object versus next to another object versus behind another object, just mm -hmm. simple interactions like that. If you have a system that can do that, then uh, you essentially have a system that has common, what you would call common sense, mm -hmm. um, which humans have. You know, you have a very natural, intuitive understanding of the world, you know, unlike incidentally an ImageNet trained network, that an object is not just a texture, a certain distribution of colors in, in your field of view, but it is actually a thing that has an, a spatial extent that is surrounded by air that could be moved from one place to the other, that has a weight associated with it, that mm -hmm. it's subject to gravity, uh, that can behave in certain ways but not others, that can teleport, for example, from one place to the other. And all of these things are totally natural to humans. Humans acquire a lot of that knowledge throughout the, the first years in their life. And AI systems so far had none of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting part about video is that to the degree that we are able to get systems to understand video concepts, um, we enable them to get some of those concepts. And that means really equipping AI systems with a certain degree of common sense. And that's what's really exciting about video. And that's mm. the reason why we have been uh, kind of pushing uh, along that agenda. And I have been interested in that for, for 15 years or so. Has anyone tried to scope common sense? Like how much uh, of, I don't even know what the unit would be. You know, it's not rules. Um, it's not necessarily layers or neurons or memory or storage. Has anyone in any kind of way tried to um, get a handle on what the magnitude of uh, what a computer would need to learn to have common sense? Or are we, you know, is that kind of the 
um, you know, the hundred million dollar question, kind of the, the Turing test kind of scenario? There are a few discussions, obviously, uh, and there are many probably very technical discussions in the psychology literature mm -hmm. and so on. There is one effort, school of thought, that uh, surrounds common sense and drives it much further that I completely subscribe to and that has been one of the main reasons why I've been interested in getting at common sense via video. And that is a school of thought uh, around people like uh, Douglas Hofstetter and George Lakoff, okay. um, who say that uh, our cognitive capabilities are structured around metaphors, basically. Uh, so whenever you recognize an object or, or whenever you uh, have some concept in your head of, of something, like a concept of an argument, you do not understand that concept per se, but you understand it by comparison to other things. Mm. And so one uh, example is uh, that, that came from, from Lakoff back then is that uh, an argument is like a war, basically. When people have an argument, you, you think of it as like a fight between those people or something like that. Mm. And so... Uh, specifically, people like Douglas Hofstetter, who I have always been a big fan of through like throughout the, the years, uh, has been driving this completely uh, to the to the you know ultimate endpoint. And he said basically that anything you do at any, at any point in time is is metaphor, is drawing analogies between different things. Like when whenever you recognize an, an elevator as an elevator that you have to walk to, uh, you're basically making an analogy at that point. And when you understand very subtle, complex concepts, like a CEO saying, this company will weather the storm, uh, you again make an analogy and all of the cognitive processes that drive uh, like human understanding and thinking are just made of the same stuff, which is analogy making. And um, so common sense is kind of on the lowest level of that. But there is a school of thought that says that everything that, that humans can do and that makes human thinking amazing is based on the same stuff, which is just expan an expansion away from, from uh, common sense, which is focused on very, very low-level aspects of the world, like uh, what objects are, how they move around, and so on and so forth. And so what are the implications of that school of thought on uh, machine learning and AI? Um, I think the implications could be immense, uh, and they will be immense to the degree that we will be able to uh, make them tangible, make them actual technologies <laughs> that, that actually work. Mm -hmm. And uh, with what we've do, been doing on you know, understanding how objects relate to each other and what happens to them in a video, it's just scratching the surface. It's like basically go getting at the lowest level. Mm -hmm. um, but there has been a lot of uh, drive towards concepts, uh, ideas like grounding, for example. So enabling a system that uh, does translation from one language to another to not just associate uh, semantic patterns with, with the word embeddings that it uses, but to associate actual at least something that's connected to a sensor. And uh, it's, I think it's quite likely mm. that we will see more and more of that in the future, such that a system that outputs a sentence like there's a, a cup on the table not only... Uh, has in its mind, if you want, uh, the syntactic structure and, and, and the, right. the words relate to each other, like as it learned from like, large, large text corpora, but also has an association of a cup, you know, some wake description, which is mm -hmm. just represented in the feature activation at that moment where the word is issued mm -hmm. uh, of a cup on a, on a table and uh, it can distinguish that from a cup under the table or something just by means of like visual associations. I think this is going to happen more and more over time. Are there any particular places or labs that are working in this area that are worth uh, taking a look at or papers? I haven't seen much and I think one of the reasons is that it is so fundamentally linked to video understanding uh, that uh, that we haven't seen much of that. Mm -hmm. Video understanding poses its own kind of challenges mm -hmm. because, of the, as I just mentioned, it because of the uh, the really f involved technological developments you need, like the lots of engineering you need and the data operation to get all the data and so on. Mm -hmm. um, because of that, there is a barrier, obviously, and people have been like, hesitant to go down that route. There is uh, some interesting work um, um, in in like common sense reasoning and so on coming from Josh Tannenbaum from mm -hmm. MIT. And uh, there have been some efforts 
happening in the deep learning community over the last couple of years, uh, which didn't fly though, um, like a lot of us have tried to build systems that can predict the future of a video in order to understand something about the world. That's called and unsupervised learning. Take in n frames and you try to predict what's going to happen in frames n plus one to n plus. Exactly. Two. And exactly. And obviously it is sufficient. If you have a system that can do that, you could argue that that system really gets the world. You know, it really knows mm -hmm. what objects mm -hmm. is. Otherwise, how would it possibly be able to render the future of a video? Uh, unfortunately, even though it's, it's a proof, it would be a proof that a system is basically intelligent. It's not, um, feasible so far. Nobody has been able to predict video uh, sensibly for up to more than maybe a second into the future. And even then, it's not really great. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a fundamental problem that we all have been facing over many years. Uh, when I referred back to uh, the struggles we had a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, before ImageNet and so on, we thought that unsupervised learning is going to fly. Uh, unsupervised learning main basically means that you take data and you try a system to just represent that data and then get trained by re reconstructing the data, by basically inventing images and videos and so on. Mm -hmm. That never flew until now. It's not flying. Mm -hmm. um, I have lost faith in that agenda quite uh, to some degree. Now, a lot of that work with the trying to predict the video was using like things like variational autoencoders and the like. Right. Right. Well, there are many, many different techniques. Uh, we had uh, used RNNs uh, back in the day to try to predict synthetically rendered videos, and it all worked fairly well and so on. And, and it was for nice. That, for that first second. Yeah, for a second. Or actually, for synthetic videos, you can go further than that. You can predict uh, like very, very, very long stretches of video because mm. the, the structure in the synthetic data naturally is not that complicated. Okay. It's not the real world. So, for example, there was like a toy data set uh, that showed balls bouncing around in a box. So mm -hmm. very, very simple physical you know, simulation mm -hmm. without much physics. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, at some point we, we became able to predict that very well and, and like render videos of, of balls bouncing around in a box very well. But it hasn't gotten us anywhere. You know, We haven't, mm -hmm. as a result of that, built systems that really understand something about the world. Mm -hmm. And I think ImageNet has been a great example of how far supervised learning can actually push you because mm -hmm. the main the most interesting part about everything around ImageNet is that it's able to uh, generate features that people then can use to solve other tasks which are not ImageNet uh, by just freezing the features that you learned and and uh, using like what they call penultimate layer feature uh, transfer learning or something like that mm -hmm. and that the fact that this works so amazingly well, I think, gives us such strong evidence that there is something to supervise learning and actual tasks that humans have to solve, that it's worth going down that route and, you know, pushing the unsupervised agenda to the side for at least some time. Hmm. Um, and so how are you taking on this problem at uh, 20 billion neurons? Um, so the challenge then is obviously how to get your hands on data uh, that is labeled data, that is video accompanied by uh, a label. And that is a big challenge in itself because, uh, as I just mentioned, images are can be labeled by uh, attaching nouns to what's the cent central object in the image and so on. For videos, it's not quite possible. Specifically, if you want videos as a way to uh, generate some kind of common sense um, that's just not going to work. You're not going to be able to do that by just labeling nouns in a video. What you need is videos that show very subtle concepts, people doing things with objects and, and uh, interacting and so on. Uh, and the standard way of gathering data just doesn't work in that case either because uh, you, if you want to have a video where a person puts an object on top of another object and then on next to another object so that you can have these two classes. Good luck if you want to try to find those videos in YouTube. Um, you're going to have to watch through hundreds of hours of YouTube video until you find this exact action happening that you can attach mm -hmm. a label to. So what we do uh, at 20BN is uh, to have crowd workers not label videos for us but film videos for us. And mm -hmm. uh, we build a platform where uh, crowd workers connect and uh, they use their webcams 
to do all kinds of stuff in their homes usually uh, that we tell them to. And uh, what we tell them to do are examples that I just mentioned um, and many, many others. Um, like behave in a certain way, do certain things, like hide an object behind another, cover an object up and, and uncover it or push it around or push it so that it falls off the table and so on and so forth. And that way we have been able to gather a very, very large amount of data um, uh, that we now use to train our networks supervised. And the name of the game, of course, is to use the supervised learning not as a not just as a goal in itself, but to cash in on transfer learning there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea being that once you have a system that understands what behind and in front and and all of these things are, that it can generalize much better to new use cases for which you have much less data. Hmm. And uh, so you've you've kind of inverted the problem. You're having them create the data from the label. Exactly. Uh, as opposed to the the opposite. Just going back to the premise, though, is the idea that with, I'm assuming the idea with is that with, you know, just going to YouTube videos and like grabbing a video and starting to label it, the your label space is just too large. It's just mm -hmm. you have to control for the kinds of things you want to label for any given experiment. Exactly. Exactly. And as opposed to images, there are just so many labels that you want to have um, mm -hmm. that are not just many even, but also compositional. Um, so it makes much more sense in a, in a video context to have labels that are descriptions, like whole sentences that tell you what's happening in a video clip rather than a single noun. So videos contain verbs, not just nouns, and mm -hmm. they contain other uh, um, word classes. And uh, the labels in our operation take the form of captions, typically. So we tell mm -hmm. them, because they act out the following concept, uh, being such something like pushing uh, an object over the edge of the table so mm -hmm. that it falls down or something like that. Um, and uh, so that means the label there, right there is uh, structured and it has some similarity to other labels uh, such as push an object or pushing an object towards the edge of the table but not so far that it falls down or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so labels are complex objects in themselves and um, we, we don't see any other way of getting at labeled data of the type other than inverting this process and, and starting with the label, generating them on our side and then just filming what they represent. Have there been any efforts to start with a movie, for example, and just label every scene uh, or, you know, at, uh, at kind of arbitrary granularities of time, label what's happening in a, a, a scene? Yes, there have been a lot of efforts uh, on generating data for video over many years. Um, as video understanding has been there, people have been trying, myself sure. included. Um, but they were usually of that type. Um, as you just mentioned, they usually involved going through video and, and labeling video, existing video. One of the outcomes of that has been that a lot of the video data sets that are available are a bit funky as training material for networks. Uh, there are data sets out there that are very common and commonly used in the community uh, that, for example, contain different sports activities um, from broadcast TV basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the task of the networks is to distinguish soccer from basketball or, or baseball or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so what's a, a problematic with these kind of efforts and data sets is that in many cases, just a single image from the video just reveals right. what you're looking at. You know, I can tell you that it's soccer just because I see there's a, like a green a soccer ball or something, or, <laughs> or something like that. Exactly. Um, and specifically, they don't involve really getting into the nitty-gritty details of the physics of the scene. They don't ask mm -hmm. a network to really attend to certain objects in the scene and look whether they are behind another or in front or how if they're falling or not falling, mm -hmm. and if they are like maybe made of liquids or solid or, or if they're made from cloth. So all of these mm -hmm. really, really subtle physical aspects. That video is so great at revealing they are not basically asked for uh, in these right. kind of tasks. Right. And that has been a problem, in my opinion, with, with the way that the video understanding community has been rolling over the last couple of years. Uh, the other thing that kind of 
jumps out at me is if, uh, I don't know if like the stage directions and things like that in a screenplay are rich enough to be used as training data, as labels, mm -hmm. but it would be, um, I wonder if it would be interesting to take a movie uh, and then use the stage directions as um, as kind of the labels. Yes. Uh, but even then, you 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 know those stage directions. There's so much that's um, kind of at the discretion of the director and mm -hmm. and kind of evolves. It's not explicitly specified in the stage direction. Yes, very true. And there have been efforts also to generate data sets exactly using that kind of information. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, using scripts and uh, accompanying movies and, and making okay. that the source for the labeling, basically. Um, Still not good enough to convince you that going the other way isn't better. It's absolutely <laughs> not, because the stage directions, as you just mentioned, are really, really high level and cultural. Yeah. The stage direction is not going to be uh, take a cup and um, pour like slightly next to the to the glass so that you spill a little bit or something like that, which is what we want the network to really right. understand. This goes yeah. back to this issue that there's so much context that's understood you know, by us as humans that we don't. Right, you know, exactly. The, exactly. We humans already have all that common uh, common sense understanding. So the direct, so the the script writer or whoever right. is going to assume that information is already in those in the head of the director or something. They don't need to spell everything out in detail. Right. Right. And I think to the degree that we advance on this agenda and networks get better at getting this floor right now that we are looking at of basic understanding of physics and so on. To the degree that we make traction there and and it, it start, things start to get to work better. I could see how scripted, uh, like data from scripts, like mm -hmm. elements from scripts, is going to be useful. Uh, but right now, like the the, fun, the the foundation is missing. You know, it's like <laughs> right. you're asking a system to understand something really complex, highly cultural, uh, and, and and social, and so on, yeah. without it even understanding like the world in which we're living. And and that seems a bit bizarre to me. So, what have you used this method to accomplish so far? Um, so we had a breakthrough uh, a few weeks ago, like around three weeks ago, where we trained a network on a very large amount of data that we've gathered so far, just for the fun of it. Um, mm -hmm. We have data across many use cases, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but, but you just thought, okay, let's see how far we are right now. And um, much sooner than expected, we saw that a lot of these subtle distinctions that we were asking the networks to do actually already happened. And uh, What kinds of distinctions? Uh, a lot of the physical things that, that I just mentioned, you know, a person throwing an object in the air and catching it versus mm -hmm. throwing an object in the air and it falls on the floor and, okay. and things like that. And uh, it's still early times. We basically just have the first push through. We, we basically saw, okay, this, there is like a non-random performance. The networks make uh, uh, like clearly non-random correct decisions uh, mm -hmm. there, um, which for us has been very, very exciting because these are incredibly hard tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so now we have live demos and so on that uh, that show how, you know, like you can just take the camera, put it up, uh, and then just do things in front of it, and it will understand, constantly describe what you're doing in real time mm -hmm. uh, and get a lot of things that are very subtle. Um, that has been very exciting. Um, it has happened just now, basically. Nice. Yeah, yeah. How do you plan to apply it? So, as I mentioned, we're gathering data uh, driven by two considerations. One being we want to sample the space of things that can happen in video as densely as possible to cash in on transfer learning and so on. But then we also have uh, interactions with prospective customers and existing customers on mm -hmm. uh, like very specific use cases that they have. And uh, so the data set fills up over time, uh, driven by these two considerations, basically. Um, and so the specific use cases that that um, for which we have gathered data and, and for which we've built models and so on are things like um, human-computer interaction. Uh, so for example, we've built one of the first accurate RGB gesture recognition systems um, that have ever been around. So people sitting in front of the screen doing certain movements with their hands, uh, signaling to the system that they want to turn or down the volume or whatever. Okay. Um, you need to talk to this company. I forget the name of the company, but I was at the Gartner conference last week. It's all a blur at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of the companies that I talked to is the company that basically it was founded by 
the guy that did all of the gesture stuff for the movie Minority Report. Uh, okay. And they commercialized that yes. into a company. And so you can have all these screens and you're kind of dragging and flinging content around in these screens and you're doing it with this remote. And I'm like, yeah. And they have a conference exactly. uh, conference room set up and there's a camera right there. I'm like, there's a camera right there. Why am I using yes. this clumsy remote to move these windows around? Yes. I can do that with a mouse on a desktop. This makes no sense. He's like, well, you know, there'd be a lot of training that would have to happen in order to get users to make these gestures. I'm like, eh, I don't buy that. You need to figure out how to do, how to do the gestures. And it sounds like you Incidentally, we figured, just figured out how it out. to do the and, gestures. And we have live demos and they just work and, uh, and we have agreements with, with uh, customers who want to use it and so on. Um, it basically just works. Uh, just showing once more that uh, there is something to the ImageNet findings, you know, if you gather enough data, you can make things work mm. very nicely. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's true, there has been a lot of efforts around extra devices that you hold in your hand, or right. even even if you get rid of those, uh, like the Kinect uh, and so on, like device, there are devices where you have a camera sensor, which is not an RGB sensor, but a depth right. sensor. And so it sees something about the depth profile in the scene in order to uh, like do its job. And uh, there has been, a, you know, almost religious belief in, in among the, in the in the gesture recognition community that that's what you need. You need yeah. a funky sensor, otherwise you won't do gestures. But, but you know, uh, if I close one, if I close one of my eyes and I and you do a gesture in front of me, I can, can perfectly nicely it recognize it. It's no problem whatsoever. Right. Right. So uh, why wouldn't a, a, a trained neural net that just sees, sees gestures, tons of gestures, be able to do that as well? Yeah. And we just showed that it's possible, and it is perfectly possible. So right. the problem is basically solved. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's something definitely sticky to the this idea of the camera as being kind of the universal sensor that replaces huge swaths of other uh, other types of sensors. Right. Um, we just need to be able to figure out the intelligence on the back end to allow the, t the sensor, the camera sensor to do what we can very easily do. Indeed, indeed. That's true. And, and whenever you can uh, do something with one eye, you have a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. it, it is possible. And then mm -hmm. you, now you just have to figure out how. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. I completely agree. Awesome. Great. Well, I know you did a, uh, a talk yesterday. Is there anything that you covered in your talk that we haven't uh, managed to to tease out in our conversation so far? Um, uh, I showed some demos that uh, that I can't show to you <laughs> <laughs> via audio. Um, demos I and hand gestures <laughs> and whiteboards right. are difficult for a podcast. <laughs> yeah. That is true. Um, besides that, we've pretty much covered uh, what I was talking about yesterday. Awesome. Great. Uh, well, Roland, it was great to meet you and great to chat with you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on Roland or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 111. And remember to submit your thoughts for our My AI contest at twimlai.com slash my AI. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.